All right, so we are in um, Leviticus chapter 16, verses uh, 16 through chapter 18, verse 30. How many of y'all read your Torah portion? Why'd you look over here like that? <laughs> read your Torah portion, all right? This is Akari Mat. It means after death. Now, the very first passage tells us why it's named that. We're going to read that together. In Leviticus chapter 16, let's read there, beginning just the first couple of verses, all right? Then Adonai spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons. So we get the name Akari Mot, meaning after death, from right there in that verse sentence. It says after the death of the two boys, all right? And that's what we're primarily going to focus in on tonight is the after part, after part of that. When they approached the presence of Adonai and died. Verse 2, Adonai said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at just any time into the holiest place behind the curtain, before the atonement cover which is on the ark, so that they would not die. For I will be appearing in a cloud over the atonement. Now, what we're going to see in this passage, and what I love about this, and it's going to lead into something else that I am absolutely can't wait to talk about tonight. What's really cool about this is, be, well, not cool, because two people died because of this, right? So remember, uh, the, 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 Moses' kids went inside, right? They had a little bit too much cerveza, okay? If you're watching online and you're not from Texas, Aaron's, Aaron's sons, uh, cerveza is beer, okay, or alcohol. So they had too much. And when they did, they called down what? What happened? Strange fire, right? They, they brought down strange fire. And what basically saying is they asked God to, or they brought down strange fire that God didn't approve of, that God didn't say, hey, I can bless that. Now, that's a whole other message for our life, right? Asking God to bless things that God can't bless. We'll say, we'll, we'll use verbiage, right? We'll use verbiage like, oh, God has blessed me. And how many people know people, or you yourself said that? And God hasn't blessed you. You're just really good at what you do. There's God's blessing, and then there's a blessing that actually comes from just being in this world, right? And so we have to understand that. And so what happened with uh, Aaron's sons, is they go back, they drink all this alcohol, they get drunk, and what they end up doing, well, that causes some change. Isn't it interesting, for those of you who work in, especially in offices or for a corporation, when something goes wrong, what's the next thing that corporate does? Huh? Blame the lower people. No, come on now. Be serious. What, what do we do? Huh? Make new, rules. Make new policy. We create new policy. Well, that's really what God's doing here. Is God's going to create a new policy about approaching the tabernacle. And not only approaching the tabernacle, as you've seen in chapter 17 and 18, is, and 19, I believe, is, or, yeah, 17 and 18, and not, no, 17 and 18, where not only do we create new policy, He also reinforces holiness and what holiness looks like by dealing with the blood issue, right? And dealing with um, what else? Sex, right? Incest, you know? Stop looking at your mama that way, right? That kind of stuff, right? So it's very, <laughs> oh, right? But he's, what he's trying to do is he's, he's setting us up to say, hey, you need to listen to me. I'm Adonai, right? And notice the whole mixture of what's happening. Watch. Lot's kids... I keep saying, I don't know why I'm thinking a lot, but Aaron's sons go in the, the Holy of Holy. They call down strange fire. Everything you're going to be seeing that God's going to kind of reinforce is dealing with doing things their way versus what God says to do, right? Because God's already told them this stuff about blood, right? We know Leviticus 23, we're gonna, or Le Leviticus 11, we know what? We talked about that, the, 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 about what's holy, what's not holy, eating right, right? We know that the, uh, so, but what he does, he reinforces it, but he doesn't only reinforce it, he brings it to another level. Now, I'm going to show you that because we see this uh, with the priest. The next thing that he does in verse 30, and this is what we're going to hang on, is this number two right here, is what we're going to do is we're going to see the Day of Atonement is enacted. So, remember, at the end of the year, we... We do the Day of Atonement. It's part. It's right between what two feasts? <coughs> Rosh Hashanah, which is what in, in, in a language we all can understand. Feast of trumpets. That's right. Feast of trumpets. Okay. So that happens. Then you have the ten days of 
awe, which leads you into the Day of Atonement. These are all, these are fall feasts. These are all part of the fall feasts, that's right. So the Day of Atonement is a one-day event, and it's still considered a feast. But the feast, though, is a little different than the feast that we're accustomed to. So in all of the feast, but the Day of Atonement, all actually have a feast. The Day of Atonement, you don't eat nothing. It's actually a day of fast. It's a day of purification. Huh? You won't even drink. Yeah, it says you don't even drink water. Now, you know, here's my, what's that little small writing underneath here, right? Here's my disclaimer. Be sure to check with your doctor before following a fast. There you go. All right. So the Day of Atonement, we're going to see how it became and what it is on the Day of Atonement. So let's look at this real quick. I want to read this. Verse 3 says, In the way, in this way shall Aaron come into the sanctuary. We're going to see how we do it. With a young bull for a thin offering and a ram for burnt offering, he is to put on the holy linen garment. Now, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Have the linen undergarments on his body, put on the linen sash, and wear the linen turban. They are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and put them on. So he's what? He's getting what? Immersed, right? He's getting cleansed. That's right. He's being purified. Now watch this. What verse am I in? Five. Thank you. It's very dark up here. Then he is to take from the congregation of Israel or Israel two he goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron is to offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and his house. Notice before he even makes an atonement for the congregation, what does he have to do? Make an atonement for himself. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before Adonai at the entrance of the tent meeting. Aaron will then cast lots for the two goats. In other words, going to decide which goat is going to get the axe and which goat is going to be let out of Israel. He's going to go into the wilderness. Verse 9, Aaron is to present the goat on which the lot uh, for Adonai fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat upon which the lot of it for the scapegoat fell is to be presented alive before Adonai to make atonement upon it by sending it away at the scapegoat into the wilderness. So we've all heard the terminology. I think we may have talked about this either last week or the week before. We talked about a scapegoat, right? So the term scapegoat, like you're just trying to use me as a scapegoat, blah, blah, blah. This is an actual thing. All right? This is an actual thing. But notice there are two of them. One is to be what? Sacrificed. Sacrificed. And one is to be what? So now, without reading, let me tell you what's going to happen. So Adonai is going to tell them to, the one goat gets axed. The blood of that goat goes on to the forehead of the other goat. I don't know if it's a cross. That's very popish of me. I'm sorry. All right. But it is, then what he'll do is he'll lay hands on the goat that's going to live, and he will basically confess all the sins of the nation of Israel. This happened once a year, and every year. Um, there were celebrations of this to the point of that they would line up people just as far as they could to watch the goat go out into the wilderness. And one guy would be, uh, have the responsibility of grabbing that goat and taking him out into the wilderness. But now, go ahead. Is, is that like, you know, they, they, put, they put all this in stuff on the scape. Is that like, like a free pass? Hang on. He's asking if it's a free pass. It's not a free pass, but watch what happens. In that time, yes. Now, we have to remember that when we look at the Bible, especially within the Old Testament or the, the Torah and the sacrifices, back then when the sacrifices were made, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, or I keep saying Old Testament, but the Tanakh, were only able to cover sin. So, like, the sin still existed, but God looked at it as a way of, like, okay, we're going to get sin out of the camp for now, okay? It still was there, right? But I want you to see the significance of who we are today and how it applies today, right? We still have a scapegoat. His name is Jesus. And upon him, the Bible says, it says that the ordinances that were held against us were nailed to the cross. So the, our ordinances, so this, a day of atonement, we have, we've been atoned for, right? In the New Testament now with Jesus. He is our atonement. That's why we say he's our atoning sacrifice. 
He's the sacrificial lamb or he is the, the other goat, right? And then we are the ones that what? He used the terminology. I wouldn't say that we get off, right? We got off scot-free. But the sins are no longer held to us. And just like the scapegoat, what God says is, put the sins of Israel on the scapegoat. The other one will be the sacrifice and we'll let him go. It was symbolic. It was symbolic of what God was fixing to do through Yeshua. Right? So now we have this, this meeting. Now, here's what I want to talk about for a minute, which is very interesting. As you read through your Torah portion, what you'll notice is that Aaron had to first be immersed. He had to be clean. He had made a sacrifice. Then he had to be immersed, and he had to take off the normal garb that he would wear when he went in to the temp tabernacle, which was usually lined with gold that was beautiful, right? I mean, gorgeous. And he would have to take that off, and he would have to put on this white linen, this pure white linen, and then go and take care of uh, what he was supposed to do during this, this ceremony. What's interesting about it is, if you'll read it, you'll discover that he also had to do what with that, went, with that linen when he got done. That's exactly right. And leave it. And leave it and do what? That's right. Then he had to go immerse himself again. So now we got to ask the question, why? Why? That's right. Well, sort of. So he had to, he had to, see, because he dealt with that, he was dirty, right? Now, what's interesting is that, one, it shows that in order to do this, how pure he had to be. And that once he had these white garments on, he was immersed, he put the white garments on, and then he went in and he started messing with all the sins of Israel. That outfit no longer was clean. It was now filthy. But then people will ask the question, well, then why did he have to change? Why did he have to go from the gold and the beautiful priestly garments that he was wearing into this? Anybody want to take a guess? Huh? What happened? Sort of, but what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai when the commandments were given? What did, what did Aaron allow to happen? The golden calf. So many believe that the reason why God had him remove that was a reminder of them building a golden calf. And God wanted him to be pure when he went into the tabernacle. Humbling. Humble you. Like, hey, you need to be completely pure. Now, this is an interesting fact. Here's what Jesus does for us. He makes us that pure in the eyes of God. Because of his atoning sacrifice, he becomes the atonement that this, that this whole chapter 16, 17, and 18 is dealing with, well, mainly 16. Because 17 and 18 are going to deal with kind of the add-ons of the wringing of the blood and drinking of the blood because life is in the blood, right? And then we're going to talk about, you know, incest and some of those things, right, that it was okay. And, you know, what, what, what God is saying is, hey, we've got to stay pure. We've got to stay holy and God makes that for us. So what's going to get us into uh, talking about these different things here, the two goats, what I want to spend some time on is dealing with atonement and redemption. Atonement and redemption. Because those words can be, in most Christian circles, most people do not know what those two words mean. What atonement means and what redemption means. So I brought my computer in here because I want to make sure that we uh, that I answer this correctly dun, dun, p -p 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 come on get up wake up and talk about this for a minute because I think this is some really good stuff I want to make sure I answered all the stuff that I wanted to hopefully it's recording I hope it is let me read through my notes real quick it's not the wrong, wrong computer you see what I just did Butte? yeah I did all right so the word atone means to appease or make amends. So because of God's wrath towards sin. Now here's the thing we have to understand. God's wrath is not towards his created people. It's towards the sin. Because sin will always separate. It will always separate. And this is a great teaching just for, 
you know, looking at this and seeing the impact. See, we kind of read through Leviticus and, and most of us in here who are raised Christian, Christianese and that kind of stuff, um, we tend to just skip through this stuff and we don't give thought to it. What the Torah portion does is it causes us to give thought to this on how important holiness is to God. I know we talk about this a lot, but you have to see this importance. See, the word atonement means to appease. And to appease means that there's a wrath, there's a judgment, there's something, there's a penalty for the things that we did wrong. There's a penalty for sin. We know that sin, according to uh, 1 John chapter, somebody help me out, chapter 2 verse, what is it, 7, 8 or 9 or something of that nature, right? It says that sin is lawlessness. And we know that lawlessness means what? Breaking of the law, Correct. And so because of God said, hey, here's my standard, right? Now, meet my standard. Go ahead. So as far as like atonement, I just want to make sure because in my brain, the way my brain works. Um, is it more like taking inventory and on what you've done and kind of highlighting what you, like recognizing what you've done? Right. So... Atonement has been made. The day of atonement in which we celebrate the feast and we fast that day, I think that's the question you're asking on that day. Yeah, so on that day, it's a day of we don't have to be atoned for, correct? We've already been atoned for. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice, okay? Paul states that. He is the atonement. Now, so what does a Christian do? What does a believer in Yeshua do on that day of atonement? You're exactly right is that that's the day that we take a look into our hearts and we inventory. You know, are there issues in my life that God has paid the price for, but I'm still allowing myself to live in, right? Maybe there's ongoing sin in your life. Maybe there's ongoing unforgiveness in your life. Maybe there's ongoing disobedience in an area that maybe not be a, a, a big deal to us, but to God, sin is sin. There's, there's not a... We, we've come to think that there's a measurement of sin, right? So oh, let's go back to your reading. Uh, go over to 1 Corinthians. What's the reading there? 1 Corinthians 6. Is that correct? Somebody help me out. Yeah, what is that? Six, nine. Hang on. Don't, don't, don't read it yet. Hang on. because I'm going I'm to have to read it so that it gets online. 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verse 9 through, what was it, 9 through 12? 9 through, I think, 6. Or 9 through 20. Or 20. Yeah, 9 through 20. 20. Yeah. So, watch what this says. Why? Or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, remember what he talks about in chapter 18, right? He's going to deal with sexual immorality. Idolaters, idolaters, idolater and idolaters. Do we know the difference? Does everybody in here know the difference? Yeah. Idolatry is what? Worshipping idols. And idolatry is sleeping when you're married around. That's right. All right. Those who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers, none of these, say none will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's the crazy thing about this, right? What did everybody hone in on on this passage of Scripture? What do they hone in on? Come on, people. Homosexuality. Homosexuality. Oh, they're going to hell. They're going to burn. Well, what about the adulterer? What about the liar? What about the swindler? Right? What about, what, is the other, what, what, what else is in there? The drunkard. Oh, you know, but I go to church on Sunday. Good old Baptist, right? right? Good old Baptist. I'm going to get drunk on Saturday night, but I'll be in church on Sunday. God loves me. I think somebody's got a song out now, right now, to deal with that. Greedy. Come on, guys. Thieves. So, and that's not like the, the natural spice, right? That's not like the, the thief, right? Young Living. The young Living, yeah. This is a thief. If you steal from your company, if you steal from your boss, if you steal from, you know, the government, come on, guys, a thief is a thief. <laughs> the government hates competition, that's right. So think about this. So we tend to, to kind of, like because we're human, we want to like measure. But the atonement, this was atoned for. This, all of this was atoned for. 
If you were a thief, your sins have been atoned for. You don't have to try to make peace with God based upon your behavior and your, your, your energy, right? It says that in verse 11. That is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were made holy. You were made kodesh. What's holy mean? Remember? Huh? Set apart. Thank you, Lise. The word kodesh means set apart or holy. We've been set apart. In other words, God says, hey, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to atone for your sins. I'm going to make peace with that. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to set you aside for a special purpose. The actual definition of kodesh is to be set aside for a special purpose. And we're set apart. Right? For God. That is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were made holy. You were set right in the name of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah and by the Ruach of our God. Everything, he says, is permitted for me, but not everything is helpful. So now he goes into another standard to say, look, there are some things out there that aren't necessarily big sins, but they're not going to promote, get you into the living the life that God created you for. They're not good for you. They're not healthy for you. So the thing is, is understand, here's what I love about the word Atonement. Another name for atonement. I want to see if I can find it. And I think it's in the Greek. Um, oh, here it is. Listen to this guy. This is powerful. You ready? For in the Greek, it means to release on receipt of ransom. Oh, that's redeem. My bad. No, that's atone. That's atone. That's right. So that's, that's a key word for redeem. All right? It actually means redeem, but it means to release on a receipt of ransom. In other words, you owe, you owe the market. You owe the government. You owe your friend. You owe something, right? And you're held in captivity. What, was, what, was, what held us captive? What were we held captive to, according to Paul? Sin. We were held captive by not sin that's out there in the world, but by what? Our sin. That's right, Scott. The sin that held us and captured us. Right? So now, until that ransom is paid, there's no receipt. So Jesus dies as the atonement. And then God says, I'll take that, paid in full. That's atonement. Now, we got to look at, so if we understand now that atonement is that, now we got to look at what's redeemed mean. What does it mean to be redeemed? All right, all you Baptist folks, what's redeemed mean? I know you all taught that in Sunday school, praise the Lord. Pretty close. Mm -mm. Let me go back to my little bubble study. All right. See, I'm looking at a thing. The reason why I want to get this up is I've got a thing that breaks it down within the entire Bible. It has a Hebrew and it has a and has a chart that I can look at and pull out, and so it's really kind of cool. So, redeemed in the Hebrew means to write an obligation of repurchase. It means um, avenge, reclaim as one's own. So, this is cool. So think about this. We're reclaimed as one's own. So we were once gods, right? When God originally created mankind, correct? We were in relationship with them. We were in fellowship in, right? But then sin entered. And then sin took us captive, right? Sin captivated us. It caused us to be imprisoned by sin. That's what the law was about. See, that's where Paul, people mess up. They say, see, Paul says to get rid of the law. We're free from the law. No, we're not free from the law. We're free from the law of sin of death. That's what we've been freed from, the law of sin and death. Why? Because sin had us. Sin had dominion over us, right? And Paul even went another step and said, whatever you make yourself a slave to, right? And so you can be a slave to sin or you can be a slave to righteousness. Now, so atonement is that receipt, that purchasing of you, but not only does we purchase the atonement of the purchase, now what? We've been redeemed. Why with Yeshua? What does that mean now? Based on definition. We don't, have the, we don't need the atonement anymore, so now we're brought back in as if what? We had never sinned at all. Like back in the garden. 
Yeah, like the day restored back into the days of, of Adam and Eve. Right. What did you say? I didn't hear you. Um, completely clean. Completely clean. And not just completely clean, completely restored back to original condition. Back to the condition of being who we are. So this is why it gets imperative where pastors need to talk about this a little bit. But we have to understand that there's a reason why we need to talk about, hey, stay away from sin. Why? Why is that so imperative? What did I say at the beginning of our talk? What does sin do? It separates us or it captures us. And it pulls us away from the Father. I used to do a lot of evangelism. And when I would talk to people about sin, one of the things that I would tell them is that, you know, you'd hear people say, well, I'm not that, I, I know, you've probably heard people who say it around you. Well, I'm not that bad of a person. Right? I'm not that bad of a person. But see, that's when we're trying to compare our righteousness towards God's. And the Bible says that our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. Filthy rags. So the, if you took the best person in this world, the best person that you can think of, Who's the, who's the, most, who's the m- most perfect person you can think of in this world other than Chuck Norris? Anybody other than him? Huh? The Pope? Okay, good. That's a great example. Mother Teresa, another great example. The Bible says that, now Mother Teresa, I don't know where her heart was. I don't know if she knows Jesus or not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not declaring her salvation. I'm not doing that. But what I'm telling you is look at all the things that Mother Teresa did. I heard a story about Mother Teresa not too long ago. And uh, Mother Teresa uh, was walking with this wealthy guy, and this wealthy guy was kind of walking with her, and he, he was thinking about sending some money to help Mother Teresa do what Mother Teresa does. And so he flew out he came from America or whatever, and he came out, and he wanted to kind of scope out um, what, 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 uh, what, what, what she did. So as they're walking and they see all of these dying people and all these orphans and all this stuff going on, she get ready to walk by this guy and there's a guy that's laying on a gurney, man. He's almost on his deathbed. He smells. He's decaying. He's just, he, his flesh is rotted. He's got wounds on him, right? And she kneels down beside him like nothing and just puts his hands on him and he start, she just starts to comfort him. And uh, when she gets done, she joins back with this gentleman. They get ready to go for a walk again. And the gentleman looked over and said, he said, I could never do that. And she said, that's why we need your money, so that I can do that. But as good of a person as she was, scripturally speaking, and I'm talking about righteousness. I'm not talking about good deeds. We need to be doing good things. But righteous speaking, those works are as filthy rags to the Father. I mean, think about that. They're as filthy rags to God. And God says, that's what those things do when we're trying to earn our way. We're trying to earn our redemption or trying to earn our atonement. God says, that stuff doesn't work. Now, the result of his righteousness is that we should be doing good works. Amen? I'm not saying you don't do good works. All right? You should be doing those things. What I'm saying is those things are as filthy rags when it comes to righteousness. Right? In comparison. I used to tell people this. I'd say, God cannot allow sin, lawlessness, into his kingdom. So it would pollute. So sin pollutes God's entire kingdom. Okay? He can't let... And so what I tell people is like, this is why we don't have to walk around in this petrified state of worrying whether or not I'm going to mess up. Right? I'm going to mess up. Uh, you know, I'm going to offend Scott. I'm going to offend someone. Right? We don't have to walk around that because we do have grace. Right? We have grace. And that's what Paul's trying to tell us is that, man, we, have this, we don't have this cloud of the law that if we break, oh my gosh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Right? I don't, don't mess up. Because back then, that's what happened. And that's why nobody could do the law. Nobody could fulfill it. We would all be guilty of it. But now we have grace. And grace, God's unmerited favor, is an ability to do something we couldn't do ourselves. And that was what? Atone for our sins and then redeem us. So now I get to live a life not in fear that I'm going to mess up and break God's law. I don't do that. One, why? I love God. And because I love him, I'm moving towards him, but I'm still in this thing, right? I'm still in this earth suit. I still got to drive to Dallas sometimes, okay? Or all over the other place, right? I still got to work. I still got to be around unsafe people. And so sometimes that stuff rubs off and sometimes you do. But here's what I'm trying to tell you is that be quick because of the, to- the atonement. 
Now, you don't have to go get saved again, and Jesus doesn't need to be re-crucified all over again, obviously. But man, sin is still sin. You do. James, book of James says, I've had people, there's, a, there's theology out there right now that says, well, well God, is, God forgives us for all of our sin, today, yesterday, and forever. I said, you're absolutely right. But they misunderstand that. They think it means, that means I can still sin and do whatever I want, and that Jesus' sacrifice paid for that. But there's still repentance that has to happen. Right? What is repentance? What is it? What does it mean to repent? Turn away. Turn away. Turn. Re. Re. Repent. Turn away from it. Ask the Lord for forgiveness, and he does it instantly. That's what it says. He's talking, he's talking to believers, and he says that when you sin, I love that. Not if. Not if. Right? He says when you do. Now, he's talking to believers. He says we have an advocate, Christ Jesus, who is quick and able to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Now, he's not saying go out and sin and test up the, the book of Hebrews. Dealt with that, didn't it? The book of Hebrews, what's it say? Anybody remember Hebrews? It says that if we uh, continue in sin, we re crucify Jesus all over again, and it means nothing. Absolutely nothing. What that means is, is that if in our hearts we're thinking, I can still go do X, Y, and Z, whatever that might be, then the atonement and the redemption mean nothing to us. Yeah, yeah. I know people, and they're in this list of things. I hope they're not in this room. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I'm not calling anybody out. Um, <laughs> well, there are people that in their heart, they're just, gonna, they're just going to do things. And they know what the truth is. But they refuse to give up whatever that thing is. And so in my heart, it's like, I understand you want to follow the Father, but I also understand what the Father says. Right? It's not a free pass to just do whatever we want as human beings. God still has a standard, and his standard is Jesus. And we are to live and strive and try to be everything that he called us to be. Why? Because he was the atonement. You don't have to be the atonement. You are never going to have to atone for your sin. Isn't that awesome? That's what makes me so in love with Jesus. Because I will never, ever, ever have to atone for my sin. Jesus was the atonement. And not only was Jesus my atonement, that because he is my redeemer, I am now brought in as God's own. I'm brought in as his royal priesthood, his holy nation, his peculiar people, grafted in. Now I get to have the enjoyment of all the promises that God has laid out in Scripture from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. As a huh? As a new creation. See, if you're a new creation, you think differently, right? You believe differently. You act differently, right? And I think this is where the, the conundrum is. It happens and in, in, in we, we read stuff like, this, like, oh, that's not for me, but it is. Look at the importance of what God did and the standard that he changed in the tabernacle. And he said, look, man, before you can even come in, you've got to be clear. You've got to be cleaned up. Right? You couldn't even go in. And then what would happen is if you go into the tabernacle and you're not cleaned, you're not immersed, and you don't put the right stuff on, guess what happens? You're a barbecue, man. You're a barbecue. They're going to be smelling you all over the camp. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, then if you wanted to look at another passage, which I love, if you guys, this is why I love, you need to read all of it, right? Because if you read the Torah portion, which is chapter 16, 17, and 18, and then you go into the book of Ezekiel, what is that, Ezekiel 22? Is that right? I think, what is it? 22, 1 through 16. So if you read that, matter of fact, let's all go over there and read that real quick. I want you to see how serious this is in God's eyes. 22, what's the verse? All right, watch this. Y'all got it? Yep. All right, I'm leaving now the TLV version. The word of Adonai came to me saying, You, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the blood city? So explain to her her abominations. Say, thus saith Adonai Elohim. 
city that spills blood in her midst and makes idols for herself that defile. Her time has come. In other words, I'm done. I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. You have become guilty in your blood that you have spilled and are defiled by your idols that you have made. So you have brought your days near. You have come up to your years. Therefore, I've made you a disgrace to the nations and a mockery to all the land. See, here's the, the opposite. In Yeshua, what do we get? What's one of the things that we get in Yeshua? Favor. The Bible says, man, that when we walk uprightly before the Lord, what does He do? He blesses our going in, going in, and our coming out. Huh? Yeah, everything that we set our hand to, the Bible says He will prosper. He says that when, you, when your ways please the Lord, I believe it's in the Proverbs, when your ways please the Lord, even your enemies, watch, will be at peace with you. And what is He doing right here? What's He telling them now? He's saying, man, you're, the nations are going to come against you. Your enemies are going to overtake you. You're going to be defeated. You're going to be wiped out. Why? Because you made a decision to do things your way and to go away from my standard. This is the reality of sin. This is the reality of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The reality of sin will drive us away from God. Always. Even for a believer, even for someone who is a born-again child of God, when they knowingly sin, it will push them away from their relationship. And one of the things you watch, I've seen it a hundred times. They stop attending church. They stop worship. They stop reading their Bibles. They stop, they stop spending time in prayer. They start moving slowly away. We call it getting lukewarm. They get that lukewarmness and they pull away from the Father. And then guilt, and the enemy uses that guilt, and he uses that condemnation to keep them away, where the love of God draws people into repentance, right? But the enemy will bring condemnation and shame. They'll be afraid to be exposed, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. They did not want to be, their nakedness exposed. But God already knew their heart. And that's what sin does each and every time. And so God sets a standard for us. He says, look, when you come into the tabernacle, now, where's the tabernacle at? Come on, somebody. Where's it at? Where? Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Not that tabernacle. Not the physical temple. Where is it? Say it. We are the tabernacle. We are the ones that house the Holy Spirit. The Holy of Holies is right here inside of us. That's why sin is so like, woo, hang on a minute, baby. I don't want that. All right? I don't want to compromise that. I want God's presence in my life. I want that fire. So see what we go through? We're purified, not necessarily with linen, but with the washing of the blood. What did he say? Though your sins be as scarlet, red, I will make you white as snow. See the linen? We've been cleansed. Then what do we do? We get immersed. We get baptized. We get washed. Right? Right? And then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. We become the tabernacle. That's why they say sins against the body are that much more. Because we're the temple. We're the tabernacle of the Father. So when you get this reality, you go, wait, this isn't a bad, so this isn't like, God's trying to protect us and, and, and help us to live the life that we're created to live. Yes, sir. Jesus said, do you not know that your body is members of the body? Yeah. Where's that at? What verse? So I'm going to say what he read on for camera. First Corinthians. Whoa, this is weird. Oh, there it is. Oops, way too far. Holy cow. This thing goes by fast. Oh, I'm now in Romans. Oh, all right. It's bad to do it like this. Ah, there we go. First Corinthians, where are we at? Six, right? Thank you. I want to read this online because that is so good, brother. 1 Corinthians 6, 15, thank you. Don't you know that your members are members, or that your bodies, I'm sorry, are members of Messiah? Shall I then take the members of Messiah and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. And that, I, I know I said it softly. I said, may it never be. But look at what Paul says there. How many of y'all's Bibles got an exclamation point after it? So it basically says, may it never be! 
Or don't you know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee, therefore, sexual immorality and every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the one committing sexual immorality is sins against his own body. So we see in chapter, what chapter is that, 18? Is that right? Where it talks about the sexual sins? The importance of that. It's big time because we're destroying our body. We're destroying the temple that God has given to us to, to come into the Holy of Holies. You guys, every person in here who knows Yeshua and who's following Yeshua and has repented of their sins, man, you're the temple. You're the temple. Don't allow that stuff to come in and contaminate us. Have you ever done something wrong? I mean, well, let's all admit it. There's times where I know where I have sinned, where I've done things I'm like, God, I know I shouldn't have done that. And maybe took a little while repenting to it or dealing with it. You feel like, like God, where are you? And he's right where we left him. With whatever thing that we're dealing with, whatever that is, that issue that we may be dealing with, he's waiting on us to go, hey, let's just own it. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's not even a, a, you know, and I think that's one of the things that we learned from this example in Leviticus is uh, during this, the last few passages we've read, actually, is, you know, with uh, Aaron's sons. It's simply doing things that, that we thought was a good idea. You know, things like in our churches today. How many things do we do in our churches today in America? That's man's idea but don't really bring honor to the Father. You know? And God wants us to honor Him, and not because God's got this ego, but because that's what we were created for. You know, you and I were created to be in relationship with the Father, but because the Father is so holy, I mean, we've got to get the picture of Him. He's a holy God. He's not our buddy. He's not our homeboy. He's not my, you know what I mean? We, think like, like, we sing songs like, I am a friend of God. How many of y'all remember that song, right? I'm not doing that again. <laughs> it's on, it is on video. I'm going repl- to edit that out. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. I'm going to put two things together. Two things together. All right, so state a question because i got to put the question back online so they can hear it. When you do it, make sure. When we, since the, tabern- the tabernacle is in us now, so when we sin, with our bodies, we're sinning against the tabernacle. Is that the same as when Aaron's sons sinned? I don't, I don't, so the question is, you know, when we sin against our body, according to 1 Corinthians, is that the same as what Aaron did? No, they brought false witness, a false worship. You're simply just rebelling against, or that person, if you're doing that, you're simply rebelling against what God said. God said, don't do this, and you do it, you're just saying, Pfft. I know I'm not supposed to, but I, I, I got to. Come on, man. So it's not really necessarily that. You are sinning against your body, but it's a willful choice. So what they did was false worship. They falsely worshiped God in a way that they thought they, they could do that in the tabernacle. Maybe because, because hey, you know, you don't, hey, we're Aaron's boys. You know, we can do kind of what we want. I don't know. Right? Good question. Anything else? I love this. Ransom, Redeemer. I want to see if there's any more I want to read on that. Here it is again, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6. Or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Ruach HaKadosh? Now we've used that scripture completely out of context, right? Like you shouldn't have chocolate, you shouldn't drink coffee, aren't you the temple? That's not what it's referring to, man. We're dealing, we're talking about sin. We're talking about sins, that we are now the tabernacle. We're now the temple of God, and he dwells inside our heart. Now, there will be a physical temple reestablished in in, um, Jerusalem uh, when Yeshua returns. We know that. But for now, we're the housing of it. We're the housing of it. That's why in this world, you're the light of the world. You're the temple, a city that does not need to be hidden. Why? When the temple is built, it will not be hidden. Everybody will know the temple is back. And that little dome of the mound, whatever they got going on right there, that'll be gone. That'll be gone. And the Father's temple will be there. And Yeshua will sit on his throne. So see, 
He sits on the throne of our heart. We're the temple. And we're, we have the Holy Spirit in us. That gives us the power to overcome sin and every other temptation. You were baptized. When you were baptized, you were baptized into the Father, into Yeshua, really. Right? Go ahead. I can't hear it. Yeah. Can you imagine what he said was, we don't belong to ourselves. We were bought with a price. I mean, really grasp the reality of that. You are not like, I'm, you know, God wants me to be happy. Uh, no, we don't. That's not what this is about. You don't belong to you. When we give our life to Yeshua and we accept his atonement, right, and we understand that we're redeemed, it means the redemption part, this is what you're talking about. This, I know I'm going over here. This redemption part means I no longer belong to me. I now belong to God. He has bought me back. He has brought me as his own. Right? What was Jesus called? He was the firstborn of what? Many. Many. So who are the many? Those, anyone who will follow Yeshua. Anyone who will call upon the name of Yeshua, he shall be saved. Right? So you're accepting, his redemp you're accepting the atonement. In other words, you don't have to atone for your sin. And you're accepting now your ownership. These are different. They're not the same. They connect together, right? But they are not the same. Atonement and redemption are not the same. Now, there is redemption. Atonement leads to redemption, right? You have to have this first before you can have this. You can't call yourself God and not accept his atoning sacrifice. You can't, you can't do it. Notice also in the Bible what it says. It says when he's talking about the redemption, when he talks about those the, of the goats and celebrating Yom, uh, is it Yom Kippur? Is that right? Huh? Yeah. Yom Kippur. So when we celebrate Yom Kippur, he said he doesn't leave it just to the nation of Israel. Did you notice? Did you read that? It's to those who dwell with them. It's not to the nation of Israel. It's to the nation of Israel and to those who dwell with them. So if you're a foreigner and you're hanging out with, in Israel, guess what? This atonement's for you as well. In other words, you're supposed to do that as well. And this shall be an everlasting covenant. You shall do this forever. A day of atonement will be due forever. Now, let me break this down into an end time eschatology thing. I love eschatology. It's a study of the end times. All right? It's a big word. It just means end times. All right? It's a study of. Now, when, I've, I've talked about this before, but I want to get it on camera for maybe those who watch it later. When we talk about being, the, now this is for those, hang on now, that have accepted the atonement of Jesus and understand that they have, they, their ownership now is, this is, I think, the problem that people struggle with. I think people want their sins atoned for. They're cool with that. Yes, pay my penalty, right? But the ownership deal, that's where we wrestle. Like, well, I know i got to worship you, but do I really have to do it every week? And do I have to do it this way? And do I, we kind of want to do our own thing, right? We don't understand. We're like, wait, you've been bought with a price. You belong to him. Now watch. How does this play, this day of atonement, play into the end time harvest? With the day of atonement, if we read, we see the book of Ezekiel, what happened, right? Book of Ezekiel 22, we see that, because, go ahead and read that. If you haven't read the half Torah, go ahead and read your half Torah uh, tonight. Uh, you have the rest of the week to read this, by the way. So um, we're a little early. We started on Saturday evening or Sunday morning, technically. Most me uh, Messianic congregations, they, they won't even talk about this until usually when they Sabbath, they meet together and worship together. They'll start talking about it. So you guys are getting a head start, but still, back home and read it. you got all week to read it. So you don't have to read it in two days. How many of y'all try to read it in two days? That's hard. <laughs> Just... At least start reading the first Torah portion, just to focus on the Torah portion, and then the half Torah and the New Testament readings do the rest of the week, okay? And take your time reading through it so you can study through it. But, so we know the timeline basically is, uh, we have the Feast of Trumpets, right? Which is uh, called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, thank you. And Rosh Hashanah symbolizes, could symbolize, all right, symbolize when the tr last trumpet sound calls, right? First Thessalonians, the dead in Christ shall rise and them that remain um, shall be lifted up into the air. It doesn't say heaven. Everybody thinks we're going to heaven. I don't see that in scripture. We see the kingdom of God. We see God's kingdom. We see these words, right? 
but it could be we getting up in the sky. Because when God gets ready to judge, and here's the other thing. When that judgment happens, or when that happens, everybody thinks there's going to be like, you know, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. Right? We think that's what it's going to be like. How many of y'all disagree with that? I do. Why do you disagree with it? Because what happens right after that? See, once the church is lifted up from the earth, God's wrath comes down to the earth. It will not be pretty. It will not be rejoicing. But then it comes the rapture, correct? The rapture is not mentioned in the Bible. The word rapture, you will not find the word rapture in Scripture. Oh, so that's a, that, is a, that is a theological makeup. Oh. So this is what I'm talking about, referring to what people would call the rapture, that we're going to be raptured out. Pro, uh, you have uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Basically what that simply means is you have people believe that we're going to, most Christians today in most American churches believe we're getting a ticket out of all the tribulation. The problem with that is it doesn't really line up to Scripture very well. It really doesn't. And then you have the mid-trib. I believe we're mid-trib. And then you have the post-trib. Post-trib means after the full seven years of tribulation, then the dead in Christ shall, and then all this will happen. It could. I like, kind of like Larry's. Y'all have heard me talking about Larry. Larry has a, he has a trib also. He is um, pan-trib. He says, as long as he's living right, it'll all pan out in the end. Praise God. And I like that, right? I do. I like that. Because he's kind of right, right? Like, it will pan out if you just follow Jesus, man, and love him. But understand this. The Bible says that great and terrible days are ahead for us. And he said, had Jesus, God, not, he said, other for the sake of the elect, those that are believers, he shortened the day. He said, for if he hadn't shortened the day, even the elect would fall away and wouldn't make it through. It's going to be terrible. But after that is when somewhere in the midst, whether it's the first, after the uh, first three years or whether we go through the whole seven years, I believe that's the pruning time. I believe that's going to be the time of pruning. I believe that's going to be the time. Because what I've always believed is this. Just watching how God creates things. And I know this is not a kind of day of atonement. It is getting to the day of atonement. The day of atonement is the day of judgment for the earth. That's how it pans out into eschatology. So the Feast of Trumpets would be the rapture or the, lifting, the taking of the church. Then... Then you have the Day of Atonement, which is God's judgment, His atonement coming to the earth, right? For those who've rejected Messiah as the atonement. And then you have Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacle. Tabernacle means to dwell. That's where we believe Yeshua will return, come back in that, that day, and we will be in Jerusalem with Him for the rest of our life. And we'll worship Him. He'll tabernacle with us. That's what it means. He'll, he'll be here on this earth. The new heaven, the new Jerusalem will come. And we will live with him for a thousand years in a thousand year reign. And during that time, the beast, Satan, will be locked away. And all his demons, there will be no sin. Life will be the way God originally intended it to be. This is Revelations 19 and 20, if you want to check my scripture. Right? 19 and 20, book of Revelations. And what you see is, is that he's put away for a time and a season. And during that thousand year season, baby, it's not. It's the way it was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. But then he'll be let out because during that thousand years, obviously, people will be born and there'll be another trial, another way of them being tempted to see if are they going to follow or they're not. And then he'll be cast into the lake of fire, him and all of those who disbelieve, who do not believe in Messiah. And death and the grave will be swallowed up. So really, the gift that we get on this day of atonement is eternal life not eternal death. Not eternal death. Think about that. See, we think it's heaven. Heaven's the place we're going to go. Try to explain that to a teenager. They don't get it. But eternal life without death? You'll never see death again. Uh, um, those that are alive during that season when it happens will never see death. The Bible says in uh, Revelation 19. They'll never see death. Never see death. You'll never ever die. But those that do, they will be eternally separated, dead. They will be dead to Christ. Separated forever. Explain to me when I was a little, a little kid that, uh, you know, 
Imagine someone pinching you and it hurts. Now imagine that just repeat, repeat, repeat for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if that's, I mean, it does, there are, there are, you've got to be careful because one of the things that I'm discovering as I study scripture from a messianic viewpoint now is that what's in, in especially within the revelations and in, there's a lot of um, Greek mythology written into it. Um, for instance, we think, right, we think that Satan is going to be there tormenting believers or, or people who don't believe. We think Satan is kind of the king of hell, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that hell was created for Satan and his demons as a punishment. It doesn't say that it was made for us. It was made for him as a punishment. So he ain't going to like it. He's not going to be up there going, okay, Steve, you didn't mind. Come here, I'm going to get you, right? That's, method, that's, uh, that's mythology coming from Greek mythology, right? So you got to understand there's some mythology coming. Remember, it's called... Um, I think it's called, I could be misinterpreting, but I think it's called Hellenism, where they've taken the Bible and tried to interpret it from Greek perspective. And when you do, they've interpreted from a lot of Hellenistic viewpoints and Hellenized, uh, Hellenistic, yeah, Hellenized the scriptures to where there's a lot of mytholo mythology. They're little gods and stuff and try to make them like, like the little cherubs that float around with the little, you know, I'm sorry I did that. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your camera, praise God. <laughs> Maybe it should. Yeah. <laughs> praise God. So you got to be careful with some of these beliefs that we say because the uh, it doesn't say it says we will be cast into hell with them. I mean, not we, but them that don't believe. But it doesn't say that Satan's going to be the big guy in there, you know, torturing people. I think what the torture is going to be is understanding that you're forever in darkness. You're forever lost. You're forever in death. You're death. You're dead. You're you're. You, there is no light. It's a place that the worm never dies, and it's torment. And I think the torment is the fact of being conscious like you are right now, but n the absence of complete light. And if forever separated from the Father. And knowing that you had a chance on this earth to make a decision. So, it's funny because I made a, you said that and I just kind of triggered. So I made up this little... That's that. cool. And it's yeah. timing, so it's really yeah. quick. Yeah. And we say it really fast yeah. that he can kind of grasp that he was made by God. Yeah. And it's just interesting that you said that because I'm like, man, that's like literally what I'm teaching yeah. him. And yeah. see everything. Because that's the hope that we have. See, the hope that we have is eternal life is that that gives us hope. Can you imagine for a moment, though, when you think of this atonement, if we weren't atoned for, if we weren't redeemed, there's no hope because it's eternal death. You're good. When this world is over, it's done. What's the use? What's the use? But we have a hope. We have eternal hope, which is in Christ Yeshua. Yeah. 